Thank you, Ivan, and thank you all for coming along this evening. I know you've had big days, and uh, we will try to keep this a short, sharp presentation. The short part is I'm kind of a short guy, and the sharp part is going to come from the conversations that we hope to engage with you in the tables. As Ivan said, this room is wor uh, set up and designed for group work. Um, it is also nice to see uh, uh, students that I've taught over the years, and despite my just off the boat accent in, in January, I will have been in New Zealand for 25 years, believe it or not. Uh, but we do speak American at home to preserve our culture. Um, <laughs> so we're going to talk about connectivity, um, which is something I've spent a fair amount of time, and, and as if to, we didn't need more press, uh, the New Zealand Herald, if you didn't see it on the weekend, talked about smart machines. Is New Zealand ready for artificial intelligence? So that was a nice lead up to what we're going to talk about. Um, I do want to just focus on a few things. One is smartphones and connective technologies, media, et cetera. Everyone's an expert in that area. It's not me for sure, but that is actually one of the areas I've done research on. So we'll talk a little bit about our research. Uh, I want to talk about artificial intelligence, uh, and I want to talk a little bit about the Internet of Things. These have all been very popular topics in the press, and so in some ways I'm not going to tell you too much new, but I hope that we can maybe look at them from different perspectives, different angles perhaps, and introduce some new thinking. And I hope again that in your conversations you'll come away with some ahas and some different perspectives. Uh, the other day I was giving a similar talk to my, um, I now teach in our business master's program. It's, I've taught in the MBA for a long time, but our business master's is a professional degree for international students and domestic students. Uh, large classes, 100 students, again in this, this kind of work environment. And they're very good students, I have to say. And, so, and I asked them at the beginning of the connectivity lecture, what their relationship was like with their smartphones. And one, the first person put up her hand and said, 100%. So, uh, and then I said, how many of you? And they pretty much were all in the 100% camp. So for a lot of people, and those digital natives, uh, digital technology and phones, et cetera, is just the way things are done. And we've known for a long time that humans bond with technologies, that humans adapt around technologies. The socio-technical field has been around since coal mines in Britain in the 50s. So we know a lot about technology. Um, and nowadays, we call that the socio-material school because, again, the merging of the device with our human uh, wants and desires, et cetera, is getting closer and closer. And that, again, brings us to this notion of sensing technologies and artificial intelligence that comes along with the machine. We also think about keeping some distance between us and the technology, and we, some of us might remember the concept of work-life boundaries. Um, in Silicon Valley, at least, they talk about work-life integration. There's no pretense that we would separate these things. I'm not saying that we shouldn't try to keep the boundaries, but the boundaries are getting harder and harder to maintain, and it's certainly one of the new frontiers. Uh, and we have problems like this. Just the fact that we're handling screens all the time has been uh, articulated. Again, in neuroscience, there are some issues around just being around screens so much, aside from whatever else they can do for us. What we know, too, is that in the, going back to the work environment, we know that a couple of things about these figures here, and I'm not going to present that many statistics or whatever, but the, the first point is that for most of us, it's normalized. We consider information, heavy loads or, or information overload as part of work almost. So it's a rare day almost when we think that we don't have lots of emails, lots of unanswered communication, etc. So that's one thing to notice. It's become quite normal. Um, another thing in uh, Steve Barley's work here is interesting. They found that, and you might find this to be true, you run into someone uh, and, and they're, they're their indicator for how busy or important they are is how many emails they have. So we use email as a proxy, as it were, for busyness and hectic stress, lots of things. There are lots of things that we do that are not email, but email seems to symbolize how, how much is going on in our lives. Um, although the good news is the email has actually been in decline for a few years, so you might not notice it in your inboxes, but statistically worldwide, 
Uh, and again, there's a whole generation of digital natives who actually don't like email. And, and I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen. Eventually, they're not going to want to use it because it's not their preferred uh, medium at all. And again, WhatsApp, WeChat, there are a lot of better platforms out there, believe it or not. So um, my colleagues and I started looking at this uh, issue. And actually, originally, uh, my first interest around the turn of the century was not connectivity at that point, but New Zealand's isolation from the world. As you might remember, the first tech uh, dot-com bubble had come and gone, and we, we were a lot of hand-wringing about missing out on the technologies. And I was actually wondering, that, uh, realizing that even with the internet, which was there and World Wide Web, we could possibly be struggling with this idea of distance and isolation. So my first theorizing was around isolation. But one day after a seminar, one of my um, then students and now colleagues said, well, Darl, you know, isolation's New Zealand's problem. Connectivity is everyone's issue. And that was a million dollar moment. So that, that was a great switch. And so I looked at the more general issue around connectivity. But we were looking at some hypo conditions of not having enough. But quickly, of course, you realize there's often too much uh, connectivity. And in this model, we are concerned with what's the right amount, the requisite sufficient, and then this possible state of flow where things are about right. We have just enough information and not too much uh, to work with. So uh, one of the studies that I, I joined um, we, was a BlackBerry study. So of course, this was another phase where people were coming to terms with. And BlackBerry, of course, if you remember, it didn't really do much. It didn't do video. It, the things it didn't do was a long list. But it did do email very well. And people were addicted to email and addicted to these devices. And they were very good devices. They sadly quit making them just a few weeks ago. So uh, the era has now passed. But they were really cool devices. Um, what we found, these were merchant bankers in France and Australia. And we found, as was mentioned, sort of categories or types. And you might see that, oh, I see. I'm kind of this person. So on the left, you have the person who has those strong boundaries, those clear delineations. And maybe it's time, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the evening. Maybe it's devices. Maybe it's uh, just making those clear distinctions between work and non-work. Um, on the far end, you did have the crackberry addicts and workaholism. And of course, the dysfunction of being always distracted, too driven by the devices, and then this kind of functional middle engagement where the device was doing its job and people were able to communicate but manage it somewhat. Um, and um, more recently, uh, we have a team uh, that is um, quite global. There's a German entrepreneur that's uh, based, the company's based in Singapore. Uh, the, print, uh, the programming is done in uh, Hyderabad and Bangalore and in India, and um, the intellectual, the academics are here in New Zealand. And uh, what we've been doing now, in the last two years, is we built an analytic engine that actually measures people's quantity of vo and volume of uh, um, emails, uh, Facebook, and other social media, LinkedIn media. And we do this by uh, actually counting their mails coming through. And then we survey them on their states, their psychological states. So it's quite an involved study, um, but it's uh, been interesting. And our interest is to identify um, people's uh, responses to media and to have a dashboard to feed it back to them, as well as understanding their relationship to our theory. So that's what we've been doing in this study. And as was mentioned, I mean, in practice, the, the thing that we have to tr we're trying to do is trying to understand how to optimize this connective flow and manage it so that we can have the attention necessary. And I often say, whether it's my students or to managers, you know, if you're still having meetings where you're just pouring information on people, that's a huge waste of time. And my, my students, frankly, have taught me that time is for some reason, more and more precious, more and more rare. And to waste their time by just giving them information is just that, I think. When humans are together, we should be in conversation. We should be making decisions. And we should be doing things that are much higher level than just reading off minutes or sharing information. And so I think that what we have to do is realize that 
in the connective moments, that may be not so bad if we're scanning emails or getting information that way or <coughs> scouting around on the web. But when we're together, what do we do with that time? I think that's one of the things we have to find out how to do. And um, the other um, thing we found in these studies is that um, autonomy, the ability to be independent, is somewhat paradoxical. Uh, so uh, Melissa Masmanian and colleagues have found that if you ask people who use or heavy smartphone users, they actually feel quite liberated. They feel quite freed up because they can do things at their own timing and, and, uh, and with freedom. And in actual fact, they're actually more wedded, doing more work at the same time. So it's a paradox. They're actually more committed to work. They're doing emails while they're waiting for kids coming out of school, et cetera. So in some senses, they're working more, but the sense of liberation and freedom is also there. So it is a paradoxical sort of state. Um, academics don't usually give simple rules, but why not? Um, there is a, this is a summary of, again, not, this is not our research, but what I've gleaned from just being around this area for a while and others who specialize in it. One is that uh, in the brain science field, you probably have heard of this, that basically now people are advising you to get away from the screens a half hour, an hour. Sven Hansen, who's a resilience specialist, he's now saying, two hours before bedtime. Now that's a big ask for most kids and most adults, frankly. Um, but uh, basically the point is if you can get away from the screens, and this is all screens, not just smartphones, so TVs, etc. And it has to do with the way our brain processes information and the part of the brain that gets involved when we're doing screen work. The cheater thing that I do, I've learned, is that if you read for as little as 15 or 20 minutes after watching TV or using screens, it actually brings the brain of, of, of activity into the frontal cortex, and you're good. You should be able to sleep after that. The other thing is that, um, in general, email is not just your problem. It's probably a collective problem. It's a problem of the people you're interacting with and those behaviors. So usually when people complain about email, it's because they have a corporate culture of covering their ass or copying everyone on the planet. And frankly, these are just bad habits. They can be broken. And the big corporations are the worst, if I, if I, at least in New Zealand. If I have participants and they tell me where they work and they say it's email, it, it, you'd be surprised how much of that's still going on. So you need to have a conversation about what is the right way to uh, communicate with each other. And you can do it certainly in small teams. It takes a little more courage to do it at the corporate level, but uh, th something I think we can do. And again, if you ask the younger members of the team, they'll probably say, you know, they'll pick other media they'll want to use. So um, one thing, too, is that better technology does not actually contribute to hyperconnectivity. Because one of our hypotheses was that the more the, the technology we have, the quicker, faster, better, it would actually contribute to this state of hyperconnectivity. And Surprisingly, it doesn't. It does contribute to uh, autonomy or agency or freedom of choice, which is a good thing. And so the biggest uh, offset to hyperconnectivity is autonomy or choice of when and how I'm in touch with you, and technology actually doesn't complicate the picture. So um, we, one headline, I guess, would be if you've got too much email, don't blame your smartphone. It's other issues going on. Um, the other sort of way is to look at it philosophically. And again, at all ages, I think we need to think, well, what's, what's my position on this? It's like having a philosophy of HR versus a bunch of policies. So, um, and one book on this is Essentialism, which I'll turn to in a second. The other thing is to practice, simply practice, if, you, if you're interested in it. Go a day, go an hour, go a week or whatever, uh, disconnected. Um, Again, one for, there are a couple books on, uh, that might be useful and easy reading. One is um, called uh, Hamlet's Blackberry, which I'd recommend. And even though it sounds old, it's quite a good read. And also this book, Essentialism, is helpful if you really do worry about getting things done. And unlike most uh, getting things done books, like um, time management books, they have the refreshing approach of saying, it's not about getting more done, it's about doing the main thing. And, uh, and doing less. And LinkedIn is a big, uh, big uh, subscriber to this. And you think about a company that's growing like crazy. They've got a million things on. And mind you, they own, their, they own the space, enviably. 
but they're practicing this too, trying to do it. And one thing I do is when I have, I have an old fashioned to-do list and I've just taken to, at the top of the page, whether it's a week or a fortnight or whatever, I write the main thing because sometimes I forget whether it's getting my course ready to be taught or doing, collecting data or whatever it is, it, that helps me remember this is the main thing. Don't do all these little trivia things, do the main thing and it helps me kind of stay per on purpose. So that's the technology in our hands. Now let's think about work. What is human work? Um, so we know, of course, about cognitive intelligence. This is what I'm sort of playing around with in terms of types of intelligence. And, and we know about that. We know about emotional intelligence, and it's important. I would suggest, too, that there's a body intelligence and in being in touch in terms of physical resilience. And, of course, we're aware of social intelligence, the idea of networks and the power of others to help us in various ways. But I think the new frontier here, and this kind of comes back to the Herald point, is how do we interact with these machines that are now around us, on us, at some day in us? Uh, how do we as humans relate even as, as machines get closer and closer to our understanding of the world? And um, again, there are all kinds of anecdotes. Uh, you've probably run into this. I remember the first time I used Apple Maps a few years ago. You remember it had some glitches, and I was driving from San Francisco, San Francisco out to visit one of my students who was at Uni University of California, Merced. Now, if you've ever been to Merced, California, it's way out in the San Joaquin Valley. It's kind of it's basically really isolated out in farm country. So I'm driving and I'm following the maps, follow the maps, and it's a great day to drive in California. It's all going very well, big highways, big cars and stuff. And the next thing you know, I keep following this map and I'm right in the middle of just irrigated cabbage farms for miles. I couldn't see anything else. And it says, you have arrived. And I thought, surely Merced is bigger than this. It's got to be bigger than this. And it was just dead wrong. And I had no way of knowing, but I was trusting it. I mean, that little thing takes me everywhere. And we have students, actually, because of our international students, one woman actually told me she couldn't get home. She got lost and couldn't get home because her battery died on her phone. And I said, geez, in Auckland? She goes, yeah, everything in Auckland looks the same. <laughs> I thought, well, I never thought of it that way. It looks very unique to me, but then, you know, I guess it all looks different to me. It all looked the same to her. And once the phone died, she couldn't get home. But that's how dependent we are becoming. So that's one, uh, one sort of element of this. Um, and the other side of this, of course, is that the machines are out to get us and take our jobs. And this, of course, is a big headline. If you haven't seen this headline this year, you haven't been reading the papers much. So it's very popular. It's getting a lot of press all over the place. Um, and if you want to know and impress your peers and coworkers, the, most of that, almost everything of those headlines comes from uh, one of these two books, of mostly the second machine age. I consider the second machine age to be the good to great for this decade. I um, always try to pick out the one business book that makes the biggest difference in, in a decade, and it would have to, I think, be this book. Um, because you've heard um, everything from uh, the machines taking our jobs to the living wage is in there, uh, winner take all economics, um, there's a whole lot of those concepts that are wrapped up in this book. And it's a very good read. It's written by economists at MIT, and they're very good at what they do, and they paint a good picture of, of this reality. Um, so that's kind of where that automation 2.0 um, material is coming from. The other book's written by Nicholas Carr, and Nick is a uh, journalist. He wrote a book called um, The Shallows, which is about brains and, and um, screens, etc. But if you're interested in aviation or flying, it's got a great little potted history of automated flight, and, and it's uh, fascinating. Uh, from the first people flying planes in the 20s out of the cockpit, which is kind of interesting. And tragically, in that book, they talk about, again, the horrible mistakes that can be made with machines. Um, when the Airbus went down over the Atlantic a few years ago, when they've done, now they've done the analysis, they've worked it out that um, a few years ago, um, Boeing and Airbus had 
choices to make around the technology. They've, as you might imagine, no one's actually pulled a yoke and pulled a cable for many years. That all the controls in the plane have been digital and electronic for many years. But um, Airbus took the yoke out of the pilot cockpit, and they have just a little tiny uh, hand control thing on the console by the hand of the pilots. And when that plane got into trouble, one pilot very intuitively but very wrongly pulled the plane up and it stalled. And the analysis is that if any two pilots or three pilots in a cockpit would have seen the yoke going up like that, there's no way they would have tolerated. They would have, intu they would have known that was the wrong move. But they didn't see it. It was being done by hand or a finger out of sight. And there was no visual cue to the error. And there is this whole problem about pilots not being able to land planes as well as possible because, you know, a good airplane, they only really need to touch the controls two or three minutes on a whole trip to L.A. So it's not much. The plane can do pretty much everything itself. But again, it's that question of how much then does the pilot do or need to do. The other scenario he got, works through very well if you're in health is the idea of diagnosis and Watson in particular, the IBM's uh, machine. And if you think about it, you go to your GP and you, you got this niggle and this little problem and they've seen three in 20 years or maybe they've seen 20. Watson has seen every case ever published. Watson has seen a million cases of your knee or your ankle or your problem and Watson's going to come up with a diagnosis that frankly is better than any GP can come up with. Now who are you going to go with, right? So this is one issue and then there's electronic med uh, medical records, etc. So these are some of the frontier sort of questions and issues. Um, I was talking to some nurses not long ago at the med school and I said the baby boomers in particular are going to be totally into this because we're going to be basically using our iPads for medicine right up to the point where it's all over. We're just going to, for those last couple minutes, we're going to want some good human bedside manner because we've given up finally on Google uh, and uh, taking in information that way. And I think that that's uh, a frontier for those professions. So just a review, Automation 1.0 is about machines making stuff and um, taking jobs away from people who used to bang and clang things around. Automation 2.0 is a different sort of angle to it, and this is why the concern and the headlines are such compelling reading, is that these are possibly the middle jobs, the white-collar jobs that are not coming back. Um, one example is that you know we mint in this very building thousands and thousands of BCOMs uh, with accounting, BCOM accountants. Um, if you need a couple, take, them, take a couple tonight. Um, in one year, the dean told me, we went from one of the local firms, uh, in one year took about 63 BCOM accountants, okay? The next year, they took about 40 graduates, a third less and only half of those were accountants. So they took 20, say 20 less, a third less overall, and, a third, and, a, and only one third in total of the accountants. Why? Because they didn't need accountants. They needed consultants and other things, so they hired arts majors and engineers, et cetera, the kind of folks you hire for consulting. Now that's just one firm, but that's one year. And if you're in, in the professional services, you will be feeling some of this pressure. Uh, law's the other way. Now, you can also say maybe we had too many lawyers anyway. Lots of American jokes about lawyers. Um, but in actual fact, the law uh, profession is the same way. Machines can scan and do a lot of the pre-legal work. You simply need a high-level advisor at the very high end. And so there's still some work around. What about all the badges? Well, <laughs> actually, uh, from what I've read in my MBA uh, projects, banks are automating as fast as they can, too. In fact, nice segue. Here's the, here's the uh, head of the Commonwealth Bank um, saying as much just this year because, um, again, at certain levels in banking. And if you think about it, I mean, there's concern about losing bricks and mortar banks. And I, I grew up in a tiny town, and we had a little bank, and they still do, for 350 people. I don't know how they do it. 
But on the other hand, my Kiwi Bank app is about as good, and you know, all the apps are actually as good as most hometown bankers. It's much more handy, it's quick, it tells me most of the information I need. It's incredible. So why do you need bankers and lawyers and accountants? One of the things, again, that the authors of the Second Machine Age talk about is they give this idea that one of the things about AI or machine intelligence is that a lot of these things have been developing gradually over a long time. But there's this sort of a tipping point. And for example, self-driving cars, another great topic of great discussion. But five years ago, people would still, probably in this room, say, nah, it'll never happen. And then suddenly, everyone's starting to take it seriously. So it does come along uh, quickly at times. But this is the slide. Um, so take note, if you do a non-routine cognitive job, which is what probably most of you do, or many of us do, interesting, exciting, the intuitive or the nuanced sort of work, your job growth, this is job growth in the US, that's good. Uh, if you do non-routine manual, so if you're a barista or a chef or a gardener, um, you're probably seeing job growth, carpentry, etc. cetera. Um, but if you have a routine job that's either manual or cognitive, this is where the threat of, of job loss is happening. So again, comes to the point that automation that we can take uh, routine out of manual sort of activities, automation where we can take what was used to be intellectual sort of work, cognitive work is, is on the decline. So the question is, are we creating enough of these jobs? We're not going to take on tackle that question tonight, but I, I think it is something we need to be thinking about, and again, something, something of the concerns we're seeing. One of the things, this comes from The Economist who summarized quite a, a lot of this, uh, summarized it well this year, is that no matter what happens, and we as educators understand that going back to those accountants who didn't get hired or the accountants that did get hired, we have to accept that these changes are rapid enough that we have to understand and be able to switch jobs in our careers more rapidly. And going back to my... Uh, time as an outward bound instructor, I was thrilled to see them say that the other thing, we know it of our best graduates, it's grit, tenacity, perseverance, it's all those human qualities that we want to build into our students and into your workers, etc. So these are the enduring human characteristics that we all still need if we're going forward. Um, and now I want to just leave you with uh, something that you may not have seen or may have seen. Uh, it is local uh, information. It's right up the street here, but it gives a good idea of where artificial intelligence might get us to. Pretty, pretty extraordinary stuff. And uh, when um, Mark did his, um, he, he presented this at uh, TEDx uh, in Auckland a few years ago. And um, when the audience first got the sort of the feel, this little baby, and they were so impressed, they started to applaud loudly, and the baby was frightened, and then instantly people stopped applauding, and the baby was fine. <laughs> so um, it was quite an, you know, an interactive moment with uh, us and the machine. So uh, we will see more of this. And uh, again, tremendous stuff. This is in the Center for Bioengineering up the street. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about the third thing. So we've talked a little about you and your devices, talked about us and machines. Now I want to talk about everything else, the Internet of Things. Um, so we've thought about the Internet and the, and the World Wide Web for many years as a social thing, basically. It connects people, and that's kind of thing, I think, how most of us see it. Uh, but in actual fact, um, we're kind of disappearing from this uh, world, too. And, uh, so there's a whole Internet now of things, always has been, but this is another thing we're thinking about. Uh, one uh, implication of that is a quantified self, so the Fitbit movement, we're starting to take measures of things around us and other sensing devices that are around us and starting to feed into our world. Um, and what will be possible with these, again, is almost limitless as we start to move into that. Um, the other thing we're starting to see is, is uh, an application, a business application, is taking these data and gamifying it. So, for example, this is, I think, a real application where an insurance company gives you an app, you drive around, it's able to sense what you do in your car, speeds, quick braking, etc. 
that gives it data to then feed back to the insurance company to re reduce your rates if you do well or up your rates, presumably. <laughs> Cancel your policy, I guess, if you, if you don't do well. Um, and the idea that it's gamified, meaning it takes basically pretty banal, boring data, but makes it more interesting because of the app interface, et cetera. Uh, and we'll be seeing a lot more of that, I believe, too, in the future. Um, but the Internet of Things, just a few numbers here again. Um, uh, only 1% of the world's things are connected. But in, uh, recently, when the new IP addresses came out, there are 340 trillion, trillion, trillion uh, IP addresses so that every toaster, every car wheel, everything made basically can have an IP address. So that we are anticipating a connection of things big time. Um, 11.1 uh, trillion dollars per year of economic impact by 2025. Um, and uh, you know this figure is created by consultants because it has a point one at the end of it. Um, <laughs> Um, and also, only about 1% of the data that are produced at the moment are currently used. So again, there's massive amounts of, of uh, room for analytics. Um, and when we're doing our email analytic thing, we have uh, the partners in Bangalore, as I said, but we also have this new partner in the States. And I went there, and uh, they were just this, this, this sort of this big company, 500 people, and I said, what do you guys do? And they said, we handle six billion emails a day. And there's only five people in this company that can read them, but they're just completely analyzing emails, not that they've sent, but from just emails that are out there. So if Amazon sends you a package, they're, analy they're analyzing what you've done with it, what was in it, et cetera, and completely legal, completely free, and then they sell it back to various parties. So the, the analytics uh, game is big time. Um, this was done as a summary of industries. So again, we're seeing that obviously in some industries there's quicker uptake and again, your industry might be a leader in this area or following, but again, it's going to hit different industries. But what you will notice is the overall growth in just a five year span. And um, things like agriculture, for example, are actually quite leading up to the farm gate, agriculture you know, it's, it's measuring all sorts of things in tractors and things that drive, drive, drive down rows. They do a lot in that field as well as obviously the health field, et cetera, shipping, et cetera. Uh, coming back to health, there's an awful lot of now data available for people. And again, if we start taking that into our own use. Um, recently, a friend uh, in our neighborhood passed away of cancer and it was tragic and, um, but when the, uh, it, was, it was a very unique kind of cancer. And when she passed, the doctors here at uh, the Auckland um, Hospital said that her husband was the foremost expert in the country on that disease. They, they did, there's no way they knew as much about that disease as him. It, he just made it his project, as you would. He was very dedicated to her and to understanding it. And when she died, he knew more about that disease than anyone in New Zealand. So that reverses things that we normally take for granted quite a lot. Now that isn't the Internet of Things, but that's just the Internet of Information and what's possible there. I did want to leave you some depressing news, though. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and this might, may or may not, after what we've been talking about, may not be that uh, tough. So anyway, uh, a few things to think about going forward. Um, one is that things probably will not always go right, and maybe this is what we're talking about. We're, as fast as we're changing and evolving and getting new stuff and great stuff, there are going to be problems with this. So there are problems both at infrastructure, security level, et cetera. And so things are not always going to go right. Um, a couple examples. Um, if you haven't read it, again, great summer reading. This is both one of the most frightening, one of the best written books you ever read, but one of the most frightening accounts of machines going completely berserk. Uh, but I'd highly recommend it. It's from the same author who wrote uh, The Big Short, and it basically roars along like that. Um, it will make you very nervous about bankers um, and very nervous about some of the technologies we've been talking about. Security, as we know, is a big issue. We're now realizing, uh, my IT friends say that, you know, the companies, it's not a question of uh, if 
companies will be hacked, it's when, and companies are being hacked that we don't hear about in the news because they're very good at covering it up. And so there's a lot of security issues as well as us giving over our private information about travel as we move around through, the, through life. Um, the other thing that kind of is important to think about in the economic space, and I'm not an economist and, and uh, should be, have a little bit bigger uh, font here, if we think about some of these players, and this again is a phrase from the second uh, machine age, the idea that in some economies or some sectors of the economy, it basically gets rolled up to one or two players, and sometimes just one player. So we have this winner-take-all economics where everyone tries and everyone tries and one day you own everything. And one example of that is, uh, some of these are good examples locally, uh, another example is in, um, in the, some sectors in the U.S., the, uh, some localities like Seattle, Amazon is now delivering groceries. So you think about, well, how can a bookstore basically sell you, bring you groceries? But think of it the other way. What will Amazon not know about you if they know what you read, they know what you buy at Christmas, and they sell you groceries every day of the week or every week? I mean, think of the information and the, you know, the kind of consolidation. And last year at Christmas, the only retailer that actually made money in the U.S. was Amazon. So you have this kind of winner-take-all thing. Um, I just want to uh, just end up with a few hopeful slides. Um, this, is, this is a picture taken at uh, Talpaki Primary School. Now, this is actually it's hopeful, but it's all a little bit scary, too. Um, this is a very uh, simple country school out west, um, not a, a rich school of any sort, but I was taken there because it's unbelievable. They're on, because of this principle, they're on their third generation of um, 3D printer. They find they're so much cheaper and so much better, they're, and they taught the maintenance guy to look after the 3D printers. This was a glove that was, it had these old fashioned sewing machines. When I was in school, that's what we had these sewing, well, the girls had sewing machines. They were making analog gloves, but the project was about safety. So the little eight year olds had programmed these LED lights, that's what you're seeing there, to have different you know, designs and do different things. They were really interested in that, and they were taught by the 11 year olds how to program. So the thing is, it's scary about this. In 10 years, those kids are going to be in these seats. And what are we going to do to stretch them and challenge them and to understand the world they've, they've come up through and to give them suitable additional skills? That's the scary part for me. It might not be your worry. Um, but anyway, that's um, something else to think about. So my other good news is that I do believe that as a, as a social sort of beings, we will start to legitimize being off line or off grid or whatever and I think that will be something that will evolve to where you don't have to apologize for taking a weekend away from your cell phone or something and people will kind of naturally do this. Um, but the other um, reminder I think in a world uh, that quickly gets curated and commented on and posted is to not forget to live in the world that we're living right here and now because life still only happens once no matter how fast your data stream is. So. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, thank you and um, appreciate your comments and your suggestions and your sharing back with each other, short and sharp. <laughs> <laughs>